Hello, I'm Talavin from the Weizmann Institute of Science. I'm from the group of Immanuel Levy, and today I will speak about my research in the topic of exploring structural determinants and functional aspects of pr micron scale protein assemblies in living cells. Mutations can impact protein structure and assembly in a variety of ways. Let's consider this homodimer to illustrate possible consequences of mutations. First, they can be neutral and leave the structure largely intact. Alternatively, they can destabilize the structure, leading to misfolding, and misfolded proteins can then aggregate together. Another possible consequence of mutation is the creation of new self-interactions. In this case, the position of the mutations onto the structure is critical in determining the outcome. Since this protein is a homodimer, any mutation is repeated twice in the structure. In this case, they occur on the same surface patch of the structure and lead to forming a dimer of dimers. The resulting tetramer is a finite complex. In this other case, new self-interaction patches occur on opposite regions of the homodimer. This results in the formation of a potentially infinite filament. Importantly, this assembly mechanism differs fundamentally from aggregation because misfolding does not drive it. To highlight this difference, we term it agglomeration. Agglomeration can induce disease, like in the case of sickle cell anemia. In this disease, a single mutation of glutamate to valine now causes hemoglobin to agglomerate. The agglomerate deforms the red blood cell into a sickle, which causes the disease. For an overview of agglomeration, I would like to highlight two recent reviews. The first, by Nancy Horton and Chad Park, provides an exhaustive description of known proteins forming agglomerates. The other is from our group. It highlights the importance of protein symmetry in driving agglomeration. It also explains why the term agglomeration is helpful, as opposed to using polymerization, for example. Previous work in our group showed that proteins evolve on the edge of agglomeration. This was demonstrated by introducing point mutations solely designed to increase surface hydrophobicity. They did so by mutating bacterial proteins with YFP, expressing them in yeast and analyzing whether large structures were formed. While the wild type proteins were soluble, mutation just increasing surface hydrophobicity triggered agglomeration in all 12 proteins. For example, this protein is an isoaspartyl dipeptidase, or as we term it by its PDB entry code, one POC. In red are three mutations from glutamate and lysine to tyrosine and leucine. These mutations are repeated eight times due to the structure being a homo-octomer with D4 symmetry. Following this work, we wanted to measure how frequently random mutations could trigger agglomeration. This motivated us to create two mutation libraries for two of the proteins, 1POC and 1M3U. In each library, we targeted the same three amino acids as in the 2017 work, but now mutated them to all possible 20 amino acids. In each library, collected over 200 strains and sequenced them, allowing us to relate genotype to phenotype. Different strains exhibited four main phenotypes, cytosolic, like the wild type, nuclear phenotype, and the formation of either fiber or puncta. There was also the odd strain that appeared in the ER. In order to quantify these phenotypes across thousands of single cells, we developed and wrote scripts to automatically classify cells into one of these four phenotypes. The script detects bright regions in cells as ROIs, or regions of interest, and subsequently classifies them based on their shape and size. If no ROI is found, 
the cell is cytosolic. If an aspect ratio of an ROI is more than 1.75, then we signed it as being a fiber. If it's below and has an area below 70 pixels, we classify it as foci. Together, both are considered agglomerate or condensates. And finally, if an ROI has an aspect ratio below 1.75, yet an area above 70, we consider it nuclear. With this tool, we can now quantify agglomeration frequency in both libraries, revealing that in the case of one POC, around 20% of the mutants formed fibers. Strikingly, in one of three U, more than 60% of random mutants form fibers. This observation motivated us to dissect the mutation data to see if we could explain this large number. We focused on two physiochemical properties encoded in the sequence, stickiness and charge. Stickiness resembled hydrophobicity, but it is different. The stickiness scale we use was defined in 2012 and measures the interaction propensity of amino acids. Here, we see the results of one POC. The more the sticky are the mutations, and the more neutral is the charge, the less likely the protein is to remain cytosolic. When looking at the charges, neutral amino acids are also less likely to yield a cytosolic, soluble protein. When focusing on agglomerates, we see a mirror image. Stickiness and the neutral amino acids promote agglomeration. Interestingly, we also find that increased stickiness favors nuclear localization. On the contrary, in 1M3U, stickiness had no visible effect. Only negative design appeared to protect 1M3U against agglomeration, implying that the charge residues that we mutated act as gatekeepers. So while one POC required positive design in the form of increased stickiness to agglomerate, all that 1M3U requires is a loss of negative design. To confirm this hypothesis, we introduce two specific sets of mutations. One mutation was triple glycine, and the other mutation was to triple alanine. Both are considered relatively neutral mutations. In the case of one POC, both the triple glycine and the triple alanine gave cytosolic phenotypes, showing that we do require positive design in order to force one POC uh, to create agglomerates. On the contrary, in 1M3U, both triple glycine and triple alanine mutations still agglomerated, showing that 1M3U requires only a negative design to keep it from agglomerating. In the work I presented thus far, all the protein studies were exogenous to yeast. Yet, a question I would like to address during my PhD is on the functional role of agglomerates in a cellular context. Indeed, many yeast proteins, especially metabolic enzymes, agglomerate during adaptation to environmental changes, such as heat, stress, or nutrient depletion. This led me to target 10 yeast proteins known to agglomerate. You can see their structure in gray and their agglomeration phenotype underneath, as imaged by fluorescent microscopy. Using CRISPR, we introduced mutations at the position highlighted in red to decrease the surface stickiness of those proteins and inhibit their agglomeration. In the cases of ACC1, PRS5, and ASN2, the mutations drastically inhibited the agglomeration of the protein. With these mutants at hand, we can now investigate how loss of agglomeration can impact cellular functions and fitness. Let me highlight here that this is a work in progress, and I will very much value your comments on these results. On the left, we can see a typical growth curve. Note that OD is shown in log scale. The growth starts with the lag phase, then becomes exponential 
before reaching a plateau. From this essay, we extracted both lag phase, which represents the time to exit from stationary phase, and the maximal growth rate. The maximal growth rate does not appear to change in the mutants. However, the lag phase increased, in particular in ACC1 mutant that does not agglomerate. More work is now needed to identify the origin of this difference. It is possible, for example, that agglomerates help maintain localized concentration due to protein being less spread in the cell, or agglomerate might protect the protein from degradation or poor translational modifications. Another possible explanation is that cells expressing the mutants are more likely to die in stationary phase, which would also result in a longer apparent lag time. This led us to conduct viability assays of cells in stationary phase. Here, again, we detected a significant difference in cell viability between wild type and mutant ACC1. About 10% of the cells were not viable after entering stationary phase, and this difference increased over time. In ASN2 and PRS5, no significant difference was found between the wild type and the mutant. To summarize, some agglomerates require positive design in order to agglomerate. Others require negative design to remain cytosolic, and natural agglomerates impact lag phase duration, and some also impact survival in stationary phase. I would like to thank everyone in my group, to Emmanuel, the principal investigator, to Hector, who did the experiments with me, and to Charlie, who helped uh, with designing the mutations. Thank you.